Knowledge is weightless, says Ray Mears in Essential Bushcraft. Now, this book was really useful to me when I decided to cycle the length of the UK, which was a great big adventure for me. But I needed to prep before I left. Now, you might not know me. I'm Connor, hey, from Debutify. I make marketing videos, e-commerce videos. I like to ride my bike and I like to read books. Now, I didn't get to choose who I am. I didn't choose my genes. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose where I was born. Now I'm a little bit older. I have a little bit more agency and I get to choose what to read next. Now in this bookshelf behind me, on this whole side of the bookshelf, are books I haven't yet read. And on this side, which you can't really see, are the books that I have read. In this video today, I'm gonna to show you 12 books that changed my life and I hope that you learn something. So first up, we have Ogilvy on advertising. This is a classic telling of how advertising works from one of the pillars of the 20th century, David Ogilvy. Now this guy is compared to Adam Smith in terms of his influence over that century. And you could also probably go and read Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith if you haven't. Every time I read Ogilvy on advertising, I walk away inspired to make stuff and I come away with useful practical anecdotes. Now this guy did operate quite a long time ago, but the principles that he teaches are commonplace. They're gonna to translate to Facebook ads, Google ads, everything really. Ogilvy as an agency is still going strong. It's one of the biggest and best agencies for advertising in the whole world and has clients like the University of Turkey, Unilever and Lego. So Ogilvy said, it isn't the whiskey they choose, but the image. Some copywriters write tricky headlines, double meanings, puns, and other obscurities. This is counterproductive. In the average newspaper, your headline has to compete with 350 others. Readers travel fast through this jungle. Your headline should telegraph what you want to say. Next up is Stock Delver by Lynn Alden. Lynn Alden is a wonderful explainer of finance. She gives away so much content on her newsletter. She goes on podcasts and it's just quite amazing what you can learn from her absolutely for free. I would recommend buying Stock Delver for about 10 bucks. In the past, I considered myself a decent saver and I put money away and I went traveling with that money. But now after reading books like this and this one, I've learned to actually create a portfolio that I hope someday to retire with. I also hope to donate 10% of my earnings throughout my life to the Effective Altruism Movement, which is currently supporting the Against Malaria Foundation. Now, I would never have given away 10% of my earnings when I was a chef or a bartender. I wasn't earning anything different from what I earn now, but I didn't know how to use my money. You know, it would just go on drinks and things like that. But now I know about investing and I'm by no means any good at it, but I understand the fundamentals. Now in this book, Lynn Alden breaks down five great ideas in history of investing. Got value investing from Benjamin Graham, an emphasis on quality by Charles Munger, mean reversion by Geraldine Weiss or Geraldine Weiss, high returns on capital by Joel Greenblatt and growth at a reasonable price by Peter Lynch. I actually have Peter's book just here. Uh, you could read this too, little bonus for you. Lynn Alden also talks about how to determine the fair value of a stock. She tells you how to maintain a portfolio and when is the right time to sell a stock. Lynn says, many people complain about corporate behavior, how they buy elections and control politics, how they pollute the air, land and water, how they spy on us and use our data in weird ways, how they market unhealthy foods to kids, how short term focused they are on next quarter's profits. However, hardly anyone actually votes in shareholder elections. And that is because most people do not buy and hold individual stocks for the long term. Next book, Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. This was really life-changing for me. I couldn't put it down. It was just so enticing. Um, I had such a great time reading it and I learned so much about the guy that has really changed so many lives today. This book is filled with cliches that you've heard many times before, but they actually amounted to quite a lot. The iPhone, the Macintosh, and whatever is coming next out of Apple. Reading Steve Jobs' life for me was a lesson in authenticity. Steve Jobs 
knew who he was. He would show up to meetings without any shoes on. And he would go on fantastically influential meetings with Bill Gates, Bob Iger, on foot. I often go for walks with people for a meeting instead of meeting in a cafe because it allows you to air ideas and focus on the future instead of having a stare down match with somebody over a table. It's a really great way to interact with clients and friends. Steve Jobs also showed me what not to do. He was arrogant. He was rude. Um, he was quite repulsive to many people, but he did get people to do crazy things like make the iPod. So you can read this book and understand what not to do in life because you can get great things done, but at the detriment to your relationships. And understanding a work or project life balance is really important. Now in this vein, we see Steve Jobs' reality distortion field that's discussed quite a lot in the book. He would come up to a developer, demand something outrageous, and she would say, yeah, yeah, I can do that, yeah. And then when Steve would leave the room, she would think, there's no way I can actually do that. That's an impossible request. But then she would go on to do it because Steve had said she could do it. That theme is present in the book so many times and there's so many different examples of it coming up. It's kind of crazy. Maybe it was his charisma. Maybe it was his arrogance, but it pushed people to make amazing software and amazing products. Now the biography is unbiased. We see Steve Jobs in horrible lights, doing not very nice things, and we see Steve Jobs in courageous, brilliant light as well. Now, I think this is really important in our own time. Things like social media show us the perfect lives of people around us, only the ups and never the downs. And when we feel sad, when we feel defeated, we have no one to turn to because we're constantly shown through social media that everybody else is okay. We don't see the mental tax. We don't see the stress on everybody else's lives. So when we have our own stresses, it's really difficult to deal with. So it's nice to read something that's completely truthful and shows you just how difficult life can be. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. The best way to predict your future is to invent it. Of Walking on Ice by Werner Herzog. This was incredible for me. I actually gave this away a few years ago, so I don't have the copy with me. So in this book, Werner Herzog, the Bavarian filmmaker, describes how he walked from Bavaria to Paris over a three week period to visit his friend Lottie Elsner, who was a German filmmaker who was dying. Lottie was a filmmaker and Werner said before he set off, she will not die until I see her. And that proved to be true. Now, this book inspired me to go on my first real adventure, which was cycling the wilds of New Zealand for four weeks. It was a slightly dangerous, intimidating time, but I loved it all the same. I've always looked up to filmmakers and people who tell great stories, and I've wondered, where do they come up with this stuff? In this book, Werner Herzog showed me that you have to go and find your own story. The best stories come from life. And if you go out there leaning into what you're interested in, then you're gonna find an authentic story that means a lot to you and one that you can actually tell to other people. So after reading this book, I went on that bike trip. I actually wrote that whole experience down just like Werner said I should. And I ended up making an audio book about it, which you can see in the description. And that actually led me to be an audible narrator. And bikepacking itself has changed my pace of life and the way I experience the world indefinitely. Only if this were a film, I would consider it real. Not one, not a soul, intimidating stillness, uncannily through in the midst of all this. A fire is blazing, lit in fact with petrol. It's flickering, a ghostly fiery wind. On the orange colored plain below, I can see sheets of rain and the enunciation of the end of the world is glowing on the horizon. A train races through the land and penetrates the mountain range. Its wheels are glowing, one car erupts in flames. The train stops, men try to extinguish it, but the car can no longer be extinguished. They decide to move on, to hasten, to race. The train moves. It moves into fathomless space, unwavering. In the pitch blackness of the universe, the wheels are glowing. The lone car is glowing. Unimaginable, stellar catastrophes take place. Entire worlds collapse into a single point. Light can no longer escape. Even the profoundest blackness would seem like light 
and the silence would seem like thunder. The universe is filled with nothing. It is the yawning black void. Systems of Milky Ways have condensed into unstars. Utter blissfulness is spreading, and out of utter blissfulness now springs the absurdity. This is the situation. Okay, a bit more science-y. This is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. So good um, and truly life-changing. This is probably the one that has really impacted my day-to-day -day life um, the most out of these 12 books. So you can soak up whatever knowledge you want to learn about life, anything you can, but you're not going to remember it if you don't have a good night's sleep. And that has been the fundamental lesson for me out of why we sleep. Matthew Walker explains the benefits of having a proper full sleep and the really quite horrifying and scary downsides and detriments of not sleeping. This pretty much made me give up alcohol. I only have a few beers every now and again because I understand how badly it affects your memory and affects your sleep, which affects everything in your life. The golden rule to sleep, by the way, is going to bed at the same time every night. You shouldn't really have an alarm clock to take you out of sleep. You should have an alarm clock to remind you to go to bed. It's a fantastic read. There's so many insights into mammalian minds, neuroscience, how other animals sleep, like birds, fantastic insights into the hemispheres, and um, he also touches a bit on dreams, which I found pretty interesting. The shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. The leading cause of disease and death in developed nations, diseases that are crippling healthcare systems, such as heart disease, obesity, dementia, diabetes, and cancer, all have recognized causal links to a lack of sleep. Practice does not make perfect. It is practice followed by a night of sleep that leads to perfection. Routinely sleeping less than six or seven hours a night demolishes your immune system, more than doubling your risk of cancer. Sutri, uh, another book I don't have with me. I borrowed it from my friend Michael at the time. This is amazing. Uh, the first fiction in this book list, but truly fantastic. Sutri was the most literary description of a life I've ever come across. It was better to me personally than War and Peace, David Copperfield, or The Iliad. It was so profound, poetic, mythical, and inspiring. You just got completely lost in the prose of all of these words from Cormac McCarthy. The thing that I took away from Sutri was that life is mercurial. You can be up at one point, you can be riding high and loving everything, and then quite quickly it can all be snatched away and you can be down, a complete loser who no one would care for. It's a really important life lesson that I hope to remember throughout my life, and I hope that you go and read it because it was just so damn good. Now, if you don't see the point in reading fiction, I'm just gonna give you a few points. Firstly, reading fiction puts you in another person's shoes. When you read a book from someone else's perspective, you understand why they make decisions. And this helps you form a theory of mind, which is just an assessment of empathy from one person to another. Now you're gonna need a theory of mind and a lot of empathy if you're gonna to wanna to accomplish anything in this life. Secondly, reading fiction is a stress relief for humans. You should check out this New Yorker article below. It reports that regular readers sleep better, have lower cortisol levels, higher self-esteem, and lower rates of depression than non-readers. If you read any book, by the way, fiction or non-fiction, you will have an increased memory capability. You can check out this study in the description and while you're down there, you could subscribe if you wanna see more from Debutify. There's lots of benefits to reading fiction and nonfiction, but I thought this one was a good point. Um, reading improves your vocabulary. And if you wanna get any project done in life, you have to learn how to communicate with people. But there are no absolutes in human misery and things can always get worse. Remember her hair in the morning before it was pinned black, rampant, savage with loveliness, as if she slept in perpetual storm. Okay, and the next book we have is Why I Write by George Orwell. This is a great book. Really helped me understand why he writes. <laughs> nah, it really it made me look at language in such a different way. After reading this book, I just, poured myself, my attention that is, into words specifically. You'll notice that a lot of people will add an adjective, this is a pet peeve of Orwell, 
very being um, his example. You say, I was very excited to see you, but then it flopped and I didn't like the uh, interaction or something like that. I was really keen to go to the park. That means that we're diminishing the value of the words that we're using when we put really in front of them or very. So George Orwell's trying to trim the fat of speaking. Give value and just let those words speak for themselves. You don't need to prop them up with a bunch of adjectives. It might seem semantic, but when you're writing headlines for ad copy, you wanna have every single word have a purpose. Um, so that people follow through, read the headline, read the body, read your CTA, you know the drill. So in this book, George Orwell explains why people write the words that they do. It will probably help you reflect on the way that you speak yourself, and if you write, it will bring you clarity into that as well. It's also very useful for collaboration because communication is the key to success and you're gonna to have to make decisions with people, you're gonna to have to make concessions with people and compromises. And if you can make sure that that whole process is delivered how you want it to be from your head to your voice to the actual product and the actual system that you're working in, uh, that'll be a lot easier if you know that what you're thinking and what you're saying are the same thing. So yeah, I would really recommend reading Why I Write. He also explains rhetoric, political language. And if you can learn to see it, then you'll learn to understand it, and then you will learn to not follow through with it or follow through with it if you believe in the cause behind the rhetoric. But it's really important to recognize rhetoric from our leaders, not just in politics, but in corporations as well. We can make our own minds up and not get swayed by fancy language that makes us make decisions without us really wanting to. Rhetoric has been used for centuries and millennia, actually, to inspire people to go to a war. Great examples of Roman emperors using rhetoric to inspire people to die for their country when the emperors just sit at home and eat grapes and the young people have to go and kill themselves. So yeah, understanding rhetoric is really important and understanding how to use your words is really important. So that's why I recommend why I write. Never use a metaphor, simile, or other figures of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Never use a long word where a short one will do. If it is possible to cut a phrase out, always cut it out. Never use the passive where you could use the active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. Break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. Political language gets designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. Okay, the next book is Learning to Think by Emmett. Learning to Think is really, really great. It's a bit of an active book. So when you read it, you're gonna to wanna to have a notepad because there's lots of tasks in this book. You have to go through and solve Emmett's puzzles. He's going to explain how logic works. Um, he explains open and closed system, and you can go through and test your understanding of those things with real life problems, and also problems that would never happen in real life, but that are useful for training um, logic. So life has us making decisions all the time, and if you can understand how the mind is making decisions, then you're gonna be a little bit better off than the next guy and a little bit better off than who you were before you understood the process. He also describes the emotional power of words, probability and value judgments. Those are all really important to understand. Um, yeah, I hope if you read this book, you'll have more autonomy over your decisions. And um, if you get, get through all the boring logic puzzles at the beginning, you might learn some nugs as well. We all think, we talk, we write, we draw conclusions, we argue and reason. We use sentences like, if so and so, then such and such. Because of this, therefore that must follow. But most people have not really been taught very much about how thinking or reasoning works. Okay, and the next book is Waking Up by Sam Harris. I don't have a copy of this one because I just lent it to my mum. But this is a fantastic book. This is probably the most inspirational book I've ever read. I read it in one sitting the night before my friend Campbell's 21st. I just read it in his garden and I remember feeling a great, amazing feeling of transcendence. So what is the book about? It's spirituality without religion. Sam Harris explains what spirituality really is um, and he explains that it's about being present and using your attention. He explains meditation, positive drug use, 
compassion. It's so concise and easy to understand. And you will walk away, hopefully, touched by this book. Um, and you'll be able to use the power of your attention a little bit more. If you want to understand your mind, the best way to do it is to sit down and observe it. And that's from Joseph Goldstein, who he quotes a lot in the book. He also tries to help us understand the benefits of religion, um, but without all of the dogma of religion. Our minds are all we have. They are all we have ever had. And they are all we can offer others. My mind begins to seem like a video game. I can either play it intelligently, learning more in each level, or I can be killed in the same spot by the same monster again and again. Okay, and the next book we have is The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. If you want to understand the confronting problem of humanity, um, then you're going to want to understand death. I don't understand death just from reading this one book, but it gives a really, really great look into how we repress our death. And we're scared of death, it's all confronting, but we will not think about it, we'll put our energies into other things. But really, Becker says that death is the driving factor for us all to become heroes. He describes us as heroes. We'll move through the world making apps, making YouTube videos, just so that we can live on after we die. And he also does a great breakdown of psychoanalysis, which isn't the most scientific of fields, um, but it's a really great primer for psychoanalysis if you haven't read Freud or Jung. He also recommends Rank, um, which was one of Freud's breakaways. You should read it, really. It's great. It's a really good book. Man cannot endure his own littleness unless he can translate it into meaningfulness on the largest possible level. What does it mean to be a self-conscious animal? The idea is ludicrous. If it is not monstrous, it means to know that one is food for worms. Okay, next book is Gulag, A History. So this one's a bit on the morbid side, same with Denial of Death. Um, I listened to this one in audiobook form, so I don't have a copy to show you. Gulag, A History is about the Soviet Union's attempt to create a series of camps with their own citizens as prisoners, and they wanted to use these camps as a means of production. And it was a complete flop, economically, uh, spiritually, and traumatic for the whole country as a whole. It's about 27 hours on Audible. I would really recommend giving it a go. I finished it in a couple of months. So how did it change my life? It gave me so much empathy. When you understand the sufferings, and you don't even understand the sufferings, but you're given a glimpse of those sufferings of all of those people, that went through that insane experience, then your daily life can be a lot easier. You can go through your problems with this as a reference point. You can look to them and go, yeah, but it's not as bad as the people who went through the gulag. I actually experienced this when I went to Kibera in Nairobi as a teacher. Meeting people who have no where near the privileges that I do, and who would swap places with me if they could. Uh, I've been thinking about Kibera every day since I was there three years ago. And I understand that not everybody can travel to Kenya to get that exposure. Um, and, but you can read about people's experiences. And, and I really do think that it can convey some empathy to the reader. Reading Gulag A History will give you so much gratitude for the freedom of choice that you have in your life. Normal, respectable, healthy people were just literally taken from their beds in the middle of the night by the secret police and used as slaves. And they had no freedom of choice. There was complete show trial and the government just used people to make things instead of paying people to make things. Uh, it was just an absolute mess. And I think it's really important for us to understand that as a history so that we don't do it again. Those who can walk will walk. Protest or not, all will walk. Those who cannot walk, we will shoot. This book was not written so that it will not happen again, as the cliche would have it. This book was written because it will almost certainly happen again. 
totalitarian philosophies have had and will continue to have a profound appeal to millions of people. Destruction. Okay, and now the next book, uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So Marcus Aurelius was a Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher. And this is his personal diary. He really is writing this work as if no one would ever have read it. So you get this really um, clear look into a mind. And I think I have started writing a lot more um, in my personal journal after I read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. It's a really bare bones look at life. It's probably the most stoic of all of the stoic philosophers. Um, and when you look at it, it's just so bleak. Um, but it's filled with so much gratitude in that bleak lens. Um, there's one passage actually that I wanted to read you. The wind scatters one year's leaves on the ground. So it is with the generations of men. Yeah, so powerful. It's the kind of book that you can just, you know, flick through and, and read anything that's there. So there's some things in there that are kind of a bit uh, mystical. Prayers, do they work? I probably don't think so. But there is so much in there that's applicable to the daily life. The book is said to have a profound impact on the creation of Christianity, on the writings of Immanuel Kant, and on Hegel. So yeah, I'd definitely give it a go. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will have strength. Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it if you have to with the same weapons of reason which today arm you against the present. Reading is forced meditation. You know when you're reading a book and you go down the page and you're daydreaming, you're not really reading the book, and then you realize you've been daydreaming, so you have to go back to the top and start again. This is focus. You're training focus when you read a book. The only other time you get to train focus is when you sit down and formally meditate. Focus is a muscle you can train. You use your attention and focus in any task, conversation, any project throughout your whole life. So cultivating a practice of training focus, either through formally meditating or by reading books, is gonna do you well. So make the most of meditating while reading books. And that way you'll be able to actually take in the information that they're trying to tell you. A couple of tips here on how to read. Block out an hour to do some reading. Me personally, when I sit down to read, I'm a little bit fidgety. I'm like, oh, I could be cooking, I could be eating. Am I gonna read this book or shall I read those articles on my massive tabs list? But after a few minutes, 10, 15, I'm actually absorbed in the book and I start to really take in the information. The added benefit of reading for an hour is that you get to read for an hour. And if you read an hour a day, four times a week, then you're gonna churn through lots of different books. And that really is the goal. Knowledge is power. I'd also recommend writing notes while you read. My girlfriend Jill taught me this. She covers all of her books in notes. I wasn't really into it at first, but she retains information a lot better than I do. Not only should you write inside the book, you can also have a little book where you summarize the learnings from all the books that you've read. You can pick this up years later and read what you thought of those books all those years ago. And this is just gonna help you remember what was being said. And lastly, don't feel bad about not reading. Time is precious, so don't sit there reading a book you don't like. If you're not enjoying it, just put it down and go do something else. You'll find the book that you love eventually. Thanks for watching.